Well, thank you all for coming to the closing press conference for the World Bank Group International Monetary Fund annual meetings. Um, each of the participants today will give an opening statement and then we'll go to questions. Uh, we'll begin um, first with uh, DC Chairman Al Khalifa, uh, World Bank Group President Robert Zellick, and IMF Managing Director Christine Lagarde. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this press conference on today's Development Committee meeting. I am pleased to be joined by Bob Zellick and Christine Lagarde. Today's meeting gave us a chance to exchange views in three important areas. We discussed the prospects for growth and how the developing countries are doing in the rapidly changing circumstance of the world economy. We discussed the policy and operational implications of the New World Development Report on Gender Equality and Development. And we updated ourselves on the progress being made to modernize the institutions of the World Bank Group. More details on these issues are in the community and background papers, which are all publicly available. But I will briefly touch upon them now. Let me begin by focusing on the policy and operational implications of this year's World Development Report on Gender Equality and Development. This is an important report and an important subject. It was the centerpiece of our discussions today. As you arrive, you can hardly have missed the huge banners hanging from the World Bank building, which highlights very effectively some of the key insights of this year's World Development Report. The main message is simple and a powerful one. Gender equality in economic and social life is, and I quote, smart economics and an essential ingredient in poverty reduction, end of quote. As a, as a committee, we welcomed the report's analysis with its important lessons globally, including that gender equality requires specific action from governments, the private sector, and development partners. We endorsed the directions for the World Bank Group set out in the accompanying implications note, and we look forward to reviewing its impl implementation in a year. We urge the Bank Group to further integrate gender equality into its operations and reporting working within its mandate and respecting national values and norms. I commend the report and its lessons to you as an important reading. Also central to our discussions were developing countries' prospects in the face of risks to the global economy. The IMF has summarized the key issues with great clarity in the latest World Economic Outlook report. We noted with concern the turbulence in global financial markets and widespread fiscal strains, which put at risk the robustness and, uh, and sustainability of global economic recovery. Volatile commodity prices and pressure on food security are critical challenges, particularly for developing countries. And we are alert to the possible global impacts of all these issues, particularly on the poor. We committed to do everything within our means to support strong, sustainable, balanced, and inclusive growth in all our member countries, and we affirmed the need to work cooperatively to meet our development commitments to achieve the Millennium Development Goals by 2015, and to support the poor in developing and emerging countries. We attach particular importance to the question of jobs. Current high levels of unemployment make the challenge of job creation a priority for countries at all levels of development. Jobs, of course, are vital in translating growth into lasting poverty reduction and broad-based economic opportunities. We at the Development Committee reiterated our commitment to job creation, especially by supporting the expansion of a vibrant private sector. In this connection, I should point out that the next year's World Development Report will be precisely on the issue of jobs. We also discussed two parts of the world that face special challenges. We are all saddened by the scale of human tragedy caused by the drought and famine in the Horn of Africa, and we commended the response of the World Bank and the INF both to the immediate crisis and to the area's long-term challenges. We also welcome the bank's group's enhanced focus on innovative approaches to help countries in the Middle East and North Africa to address the social economic consequences of their current transition. Finally, we discussed the ongoing process of modernization at the World Bank Group. Here, I want especially to emphasize the contribution that the, that the bank group is making to greater transparency and better diffusion of information about development issues th through its open data, open knowledge, open solutions initiative. 
which opens up a huge repository of data on development to anyone with access to the internet. I also want to commend the new World Bank scorecard that will improve accountability and better reflect the World Bank Group's accomplishment. Thank you very much. Thank you. President Zellick. Well, thank you, Rich, and thank you, Chairman. Um, the Development Committee meeting is important for the World Bank because it enables us to hear directly from our shareholders beyond the normal country dialogues and in concert uh, with other countries. This invaluable interaction helps us to make improvements to our work in order to better serve our clients, developing countries. Since the middle of 2008, when the global crisis really began to take hold, the World Bank Group has committed $196 billion to developing countries from IBRD, from IDA, from IFC, our private sector arm, and from MEGA, our guarantee agency. Total disbursements were $126 billion faster during the most heated period of the downturn. In the discussions we had today on the state of the global economy, it was clear that shareholders want us to persist in providing this vital source of support for developing countries. And this may become more important if the early signs of a possible slowdown in their economies turns to reality. In low-income countries, this risk adds urgency to our work to build safety net programs to shield the most vulnerable from a downturn. We've helped expand the conditional cash transfer model that was pioneered by Mexico and Brazil to over 40 countries. And we've helped 40 more countries implement other types of safety nets. But we have more to go and the nets can be stronger. Shareholders want us to assist in real time to crises as they emerge in the global economy. A good example is the decision we announced today to boost World Bank assistance to the countries in the Horn of Africa to $1.88 billion over five years from the previously announced sum of $500 million. This will include $250 million from the crisis response window in the International Development Association, our fund for the poorest. This crisis window is a good example. It's a new tool. We called for it, designed it, and persuaded the IDA donors to endorse it just last year. The World Bank is supporting the common call for action in the Horn of Africa that's being led by the UN humanitarian agencies with stalwart support by the UK, Australia, European Commission, United States, and others. In addition to addressing today's disaster, our effort will be to help build recovery for tomorrow and resilience for the future. A humanitarian crisis should not and need not be a perpetual crisis. While keeping up what we're doing, our shareholders also want us to find new ways to do better, and we'll do that. We will press on with the modernization agenda to make the bank group more flexible, focused on clients, open, accountable, and always driven with attention to results. These are tough times, and taxpayers deserve the best value for money that their, taxpayer, their tax dollars and our revenues can buy. Aside from crisis response, I was also pleased to hear the endorsement of shareholders for two long-term priorities of the World Bank Group. Shareholders agreed with the findings of our World Development Report on gender, that equality between men and women is not only a right in and of itself, but it's also smart economics and essential to overcoming poverty. This is common sense that's not always commonly believed. Yet how can a society reach its full potential if half its population is too often treated as second-class citizens? So we'll now work to ensure that the implications for gender are embedded in everything we do, from land titling to designing social security systems to infrastructure projects. There was also shareholder endorsement for the bank's new Next World Development Report on jobs. With unemployment soaring in developed countries and a youth bulge and lack of jobs, and the lack of dignity associated with work among the many causes of the Arab Spring, this project could not come at a better time. We also had a chance during these meetings to discuss the global situation, and particularly the looming danger that failure to take decisive action in Europe and the United States may shake the entire global economy, throwing developing countries off track, and they are today's engine of global growth. The numbers emerging out of developing countries over the past month, 
even the past week, are shaking and shaky. As Ben Franklin said during another era of crisis, we must hang together. As men and women, as developed and developing economies, as G20 and G187, our entire World Bank membership, or we'll hang separately. And that, I think, is the fundamental message of this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, a few words about the current situation, the recommended macroeconomic policies and the role that uh, the international community and the International Monetary Fund can uh, play in that regard. Concerning the economic situation, uh, the low-income countries are doing relatively well in the current circumstances. Emerging and de developing economy uh, growth has been in the range of 5 to 6 percent uh, and is predicted, forecasted to be in the same uh, range of numbers in 2012. So compared with other forecasts for advanced economies, for instance, it's, it's, a, it's a very good um, level of growth that is um, forecasted. But we shouldn't be under any illusion. And as uh, President Zulik indicated, we are in this together. And the low-income countries, in particular the developing countries in general, are clearly uh, at risk uh, if there is economic dislocation in the advanced economies. So resolving the crisis in the advanced economies is uh, a major priority because it affects everybody, not just the advanced economies, but also uh, the rest of the, of the economies. In terms of policy uh, recommendations, uh, what certainly the Fund uh, has recommended in its various publications and review is to make sure that the low-income countries rebuild their uh, strength and to that extent that they rebuild their buffers. They had developed policy buffers that have protected them during the crisis, that have been eroded as a result of the crisis, that needs to be rebuilt. Second, they need to protect spending on infrastructure for growth and continue to drive to diversify uh, their sources of, uh, of uh, value creation. And finally, they need to continuously protect their social safety nets, because clearly in times of crisis uh, they will be uh, needed to protect the poor, particularly from the high food prices and the high price of commodities. Now, as far as the international communities and the, and the IMF uh, is concerned, certainly what we, we hope and what we call for is that donors uh, must be uh, kept to their promises, and AIDS budgets in particular should be, should be maintained. Uh, trade should be encouraged, market access should be encouraged so that those that actually produce and export in the low-income countries can have better access uh, to uh, countries that import. And private sector investment should be encouraged. So those are the, the you know, clearly the expectations that we have from the donors community and uh, as far as we're concerned we will continue to support the low-income countries strongly be it by policy advice, by specific surveillance, uh, by specific lending instrument and in that vein I would simply call your attention to the fact that we will be shortly uh, discussing what we call a vulnerability exercise paper which will focus specifically on the low-income countries that will be discussed at the board uh, in the next in the coming weeks and second we will mechanically extend the very concessional terms at which our PRGT facility is extended to the low income countries that's the poverty reduction and growth facility that is extended at virtually zero interest that will be continued in 2012 